Uh, so, um, down in Arizona, there's a mountain range called the Superstition Mountains. And people, um, there's one legend uh, which dates back into the 1800s um, about the lost Dutchman's mine. Uh, and a, a miner died in 1891, and he <clears throat> um, told his uh, boarding house owner that he had discovered a, the mother load, which is a, a huge vein of gold, but nobody's been able to find that <laughs> since then. But people have looked and are still looking today in the Superstition Mountains down in Arizona for gold, but predating, predating the Lost Dutchman mine were stories for centuries of gold that the Indians had mined in the Superstition Mountains. So uh, the mountains have drawn gold hunters for for a long, 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 long time. And <clears throat> this story takes place in uh, <clears throat> about 18, the late 1840s, 1850s, <clears throat> 180 years ago, something like that. So there's a, a very, very, very old town named Mesa, Arizona. It's been around forever. <clears throat> Literally, it's been around with Indians living there. It's been around for more than a thousand years. But <clears throat> anyway, in the late 1840s, and it might have been the early 1850s, because no one's quite sure. A man showed up in Mesa from the East Coast, and he was determined to find the mine or mines that have been talked about where the Indians had mined fabulous gold. For centuries. His name was Dean, and he arrived in Mesa <clears throat> and set about shopping. Had, he had some money to start with. He bought a couple of donkeys, and he bought uh, camping supplies, food, a pick, uh, axe, cut firewood where there was firewood to be cut, <clears throat> um, uh, mining pans, which you use to mine uh, gold out of a river, <clears throat> and he took off. And he disappeared into the, um, into the desert. And he was gone for several months. And when he came back, his, <clears throat> his gear was well used, and his clothes weren't so, and his boots and stuff weren't so shiny new as they were when he left. And the people in the town asked him if he'd had any luck, and he said nope, but he was... Um, he, his enthusiasm was undiminished, unchanged. So he got some more supplies, and stayed for two or three days, and took off again. And he was gone for four or five months this time. <clears throat> Came back, no gold. But he said he'd been up in the mountains and he'd found some promising areas. Well, this went on year after year after year. And Dean grew a big beard, and he'd come into town, and his clothes and his donkeys and would be covered with dust and dirt. <clears throat> he'd stay a few days, buy supplies, and be off for another few months. Now, 
during the years, he became quite friendly with the guy who was the assayer. And the assayer is the guy who um, takes whatever gold you bring and he weighs it and, get, and pays you, you know, gives it a value by weight and pays you for it. Now, D Dean occasionally would come in with some gold dust and some nuggets because he, he not only looked at the mountains, but he looked, you know, he panned the streams and stuff. And he would find a little gold dust and a few nuggets here and there. So it wasn't that he never found anything, but he was looking for, he was looking for the big hit, the big vein or seam of gold in rock, in rocks in the mountains. The years went by. 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. He started, you know, to get pretty old. And the, the work of walking out on the desert with his donkeys and digging up ground and stuff started to wear on him. And he started to look, you know, pretty old. And his beard was all the way down to his, down to his belt. And he'd come in, and the one guy he'd always go to see that became a friend of his was the assayer, whose name was Thomas. And he'd stay, you know, he'd stay at a boarding house, you know, a boarding house where a woman would rent rooms for a few days and go back in the desert. 25 years after he'd been searching one night, far, far out in the desert, near the mountain, he was camped under a high um, bluff. A bluff would be like a high hill or a ridge with rocky, uh, rocky outcroppings at the top. And he was camping in a small grove of trees. And it was a beautiful night, beautiful stars, and his donkeys were grazing. There was a little spring there. And as the sun was going down, he happened to look up at the top of the bluff. And he noticed a um, dark place where the, uh, that the sun should have shown all the rock, but they noticed a dark place uh, in the rock that he had not seen before. So... Next morning at dawn, he climbed up, and it was a long climb up the bluff. And just under the top of the bluff, there was a funny um, combination of rocks. And in around a corner of a rock, he saw an opening. There was a cave. And he went back into the cave, and he saw that it went further than, than, than he could go. It got dark, so he had to go back down to his camp, get some candles and a pick, and he went back up, and he went to, he lit a candle, and he went in, and the cave kind of went straight back, but it was a whole lot further back than it looked like at, from, at, the, at the outside. And so he kept going back and kept going back. And then he saw on the floor of the cave from the flickering light of the candle a pot made of clay. And he thought to himself, huh, Indians use this cave. That looks really, really old. They, they used it a long, long time ago, probably for shelter, maybe even a place to live. And he kept going back. And he got, oh gosh, he probably was uh, 60 yards that's a pretty long way into the cave, and um, it it ended. There was a 
a wall at the end. And so he put his candle down and started poking around with his pick. His pick's like kind of like a pickaxe. And he would start poking around with his pick. And some of the dirt and rock fell away on the right-hand side where he was kind of working with his pick. And he thought he saw a different color in the rock. And so he swung his pick pretty hard and out fell a chunk of rock that didn't look like rock. And um, he rubbed it off with his hands and knelt down by his candle. And it was yellow. Rubbed it, rubbed it, rubbed it, made sure. And it was it was a pretty good sized piece of rock. It was probably about as big as uh, as a fist. I mean, it wasn't. We're not talking about a small thing. It was a pretty good. And so he started. I mean, he got tremendously excited and he started hacking away at the wall. And he knocked another chunk loose, and was just going to the candle to check it out when the candle went out. The, the candle had shrunk down shrunk down, shrunk down, and went out. So he fell around in the dark, got both pieces of rock, and made his way back to the front of the cave. And he got out in the sunlight, and sure enough, both pieces of rock were yellow. So he scrambled down the hill, down to his camp, and he got some more candles, and he got his supplies, or not, not, not his camping supplies, but more mining tools, another pick, um, some sacks, and his donkeys were fine. There was plenty of grass around the stream, and he went back up and went into the cave and started mining at the back of the cave. And with better light, he could see that there was a seam. Now, a seam is a vein. It, it could be this high, or it could be, you know, higher than that, wider than that. And he could see that there was a seam running back uh, towards the end of the cave on the right hand side and he started using his pick and using his pick and gold bits of gold fell out and it wasn't easy I mean they weren't just falling out like you know like marbles or something I mean they, he had to pick and work at it and at the end of the day um, he had a pretty pretty good stack of gold pieces and so he worked and he worked and he collected over a period of the next two three weeks he collected two pretty good sized sacks um maybe eh, Maybe the size of those white garbage sacks, like a 13-gallon garbage sack you get and you put in your kitchen. About two of those full of gold. They, the sacks were made out of heavy, um, uh, heavy, uh, not canvas, but uh, burlap, heavy burlap. He filled two, two of them. And he took them back down to his campsite. And he looked for a tree nearby, and there was a. He was in a. His campsite was in a grove of trees. But he was smart enough to know that, in addition to miners out on the desert, there were also people out on the desert that liked to steal from the miners. So, um, after the, he'd been working maybe a week, maybe ten days to col to gather these two big sacks, and so what he the next day. 
what he did was he buried him. He buried him next to a tree on the outer edge of the grove of trees. And he buried him real carefully and smoothed the ground over and placed some rocks around. And unless you had dug the hole, you'd never know that the um, that there was anything buried there. Well, uh, he went on mining, but what happened was that the vein ran uh, ran to the solid rock at the back of the cave, and he couldn't break through that. So he knew he had to uh, go back to town. And it was a three and a half day walk with his donkeys into town. And he took, so he did, because he knew he needed some dynamite. He knew he needed dynamite to break the back wall of the cave and expose the vein so he could, you know, mine more gold. So he, he, he walked to town with his donkeys, and he took, he took just two or three small pieces of gold with him. He went, as soon as he got to town, he went to the assayer's office and showed the gold to the assayer. And Thomas said, looked at it, examined it. He said, this is pure gold. I mean, this is, where, where did you get this? And uh, Dean wouldn't, would, of course, wouldn't say. He just said, no, I kind of wandering around out in the desert and kind of picked it up. And the assayer said, this is pure. And what you brought me is worth several thousand dollars. I mean, these are small, small pieces, but it's worth several thousand dollars. And Dean said, I don't want to draw any attention to anything. Would you keep the money for me. Don't say anything to anybody. Just keep the money for me, and I'll be back. So he he took a little of the money and went to the hardware store. I mean, we're talking, you know, in the eighteen. Well, this is probably now. This is probably now eighteen. 70s. So, you know, a lot of time had gone by, and he bought he bought uh, some dynamite. Now, miners were buying dynamite all the time, so that wasn't unusual. He hadn't particularly bought dynamite uh, before, but it didn't matter because miners were always buying dynamite to try and blow rocks apart and see if there was gold. So he bought some dynamite, loaded up on supplies and left. Now, before he had, um, before he, out in the desert, three and a half days, I mean, there's a lot of mesas. There's a lot of hills and ridges and everything. And he, to distinguish the one where his cave was, he had really studied it. And he backed way out in the desert and looked at it. And he noticed that the rock at the top of the mesa that had made this funny, that had hidden the cave was sort of shaped like a buffalo head. Big head of a buffalo with a nose and one horn. Kind of, you could imagine, not a real sharp horn, like a horn that was broken off, sticking up, It, it but it was... From out, from a ways away, from a quarter of a mile away, it looked like a buffalo head. And that's how he marked the spot. So we went back, and uh, um, nobody had disturbed his camp. And he got his donkey staked out, and he went up climbed up the 
the day after he got back, he climbed up with his dynamite and went way back into the cave and set his dynamite to blow the back wall of the cave apart so he could follow the seam of gold into the it behind the back wall. Now, Dean had never worked with dynamite before. And so he put three or four sticks of dynamite along the back wall, tied the fuses to a single strand of fuse, and ran the, the fuse out to the front of the cave. But the problem was that he hadn't bought a long enough stretch of fuse. And he was about 10 or 15 yards short of the mouth of the cave. But he figured, you know, it's 60 yards back there. I'll just light the fuse and run outside. And even though it was a real steep slope outside, he said, I'll just run outside, run around the corner of the rocks and wait for it to blow, which is exactly what he did. He lit the fuse, bzzz, the fuse took off, ran toward the back of the cave. He ran outside and, you know, hid around the back of the cave, at the back of the rocks, hid to the side, around the side of the rocks, and waited. And the dynamite blew. But he had put a lot more dynamite, or more, the, the, the charge he had put was a lot more powerful than he expected. And there was this huge explosion and rock started to fall inside the cave and outside the cave. And a big chunk of rock fell on him and knocked him down the hill tumbling down the hill, all the way down the hill to his camp. And um, he, uh, he wasn't killed, but he was badly injured. And he had a big, big cut on his head, a big cut and huge bruising on his head. Ten days later, Dean staggered into Mesa, dried blood all over the side of his head, down on his shirt, on his beard. He had a rope, and on the rope were his two donkeys, he was leading his two donkeys. And he staggered in, just got inside the town um, limits, and fell down and collapsed. And the town people ran and got a doctor, and they carried Dean into the doctor's office. And he was incoherent, which means he was babbling. He, was, he wasn't making sense with what he was saying. And he kept mumbling and mumbling. And finally, the doc, the doc said he has been, he has had got a severe head injury, severe head injury. And uh, I, I don't know whether he's going to survive. And I don't know. I don't know if he even knows what's going on. But he did get back to town. And then the doc leaned down and Dean was saying, I say it, I promise. And the doc said to somebody, run and get Thomas the assayer. Run and get him. And so they did. And Thomas came, and he hardly recognized Dean. He was so filthy and bloody and messed up. And he leaned down, Thomas leaned down to Dean's mouth. And Dean was saying, Buffalo Head, Buffalo Head, Ridge.
ridge, buffalo head, gold, gold, buried, buried. And his voice paused. And then he said, find it, find it. Thomas didn't say anything to anybody, but uh, several days later, he started out into the desert on horseback with the pack horse, and he searched the desert, and he searched and searched for the next 15 years looking for a rock formation of a buffalo head. But the dynamite had blown the buffalo head apart. And Thomas never found Wayne's camp never found the gold. The gold remains buried to this day under a tree somewhere out in the desert near the Superstition Mountains. And that is the end of the story. So if you want to work on it, you might uh, uh, you might have a try because the the buffalo head's gone. You might have a try at an alternate ending where maybe uh, maybe Thomas does find the gold. But you can have a try at writing that if you'd like, and uh, see what you think.